Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning and welcome to lecture 6 of the course introduction to interaction design. In the last uh, lecture we were looking at a uh, conceptual design and how it is uh, important for the design process. We also uh, saw the research questions how we can effectively frame research questions and then what where the conceptual design fits in the overall scheme of the design field. So, today we will continue uh, with conceptual uh, design and we will look at the uh, interaction types. One way of looking at how to conceptualize the design space is to look at the interaction types that will define the user experience. So, these are basically ways in which the user will interact with the product or the application. So, for example, when Amazon suggests an item based on the user uh, past purchase behavior or when for example, a Netflix pauses a person's viewing to ask them whether they would like to continue watching or not. So, these are examples of how uh, people are interacting with how the designers are conceptualizing that how will people interact with their platforms. So, the one way of doing it is instructing. So, where the users issue instructions to a system and this is done in several ways by uh, typing commands or by uh, selecting from the menu or by uh, multi touch screens, even voice commands can be given or gesturing or pressing the buttons. So, these uh, are several ways and which particular style will be best suited, which particular uh, application or interaction style will be best suited that the designer has to take a call on. We also saw in the previous lecture about accessibility and inclusiveness. So, how we can also uh, incorporate those features and which of these will help uh, in, you know in the uh, effective instructing by the user. The other way to do is by conversing and there is wherein there is a conversation, the user is conversing with the HCI and there is a dialogue with the system. So, now the user can speak through the interface where they can uh, type the question and the uh, system will reply back uh, either in text or speech. So, uh, this is how the users also converse and now the systems are getting so smart, especially with the introduction of AI that uh, artificial intelligence that the system uh, understands uh, and uh, uh, knows the needs and requirements and answers like you know almost like a person who is conversing. Another way is uh, manipulating where the users interact with objects in a virtual or a physical space by manipulating them. So, for example, uh, opening, holding, closing, placing all these kind of uh, activities and uh, users can improve their knowledge of how to interact with the objects. So, uh, on our mobile phone for example, when we want to club the, the screen is uh, you know all filled up and we want to combine similar activities, we place, we hold them and place them in a folder. So, how the user is getting that flexibility to manipulate uh, the interface that he is interacting with. Another is exploring where the users are moving through a virtual environment or maybe it could be a physical uh, space and virtual environments include 3D worlds, augmented virtual reality which are uh, really being used in a lot of different ways here to understand user to help a user um, get the feel of the space. It is used in you know for uh, pilots, for soldiers, they have many applications where without being there the person can actually 
learn the technique. So, um, when it comes to physical spaces, then we can use sensor based technologies that include smart rooms and uh, ambient environments and these enable people to capitalize on familiarity. Uh, responding is where the system initiates the interaction and the user chooses whether to respond or not. Now, uh, for example, these mobile uh, location based technology, so it uh, speaks to the uh, user whether or not he asks for the information. So, it will tell uh, in 200 meters take a right turn, take a left turn. So, uh, it is just responding uh, to the user. Uh, there are several of these products that designers are working on including these uh, assistive robots uh, especially for uh, people with special needs or for elderly people wherein you know who probably do not have company and how these robots which are uh, AI enabled they converse with the uh, elderly person or the lonely person and they almost feel like they are talking to a friend. So, how can this uh, uh, technology be applied? How can we apply these kind of interactions where people can benefit uh, from them? So, conceptual uh, uh, design has certain terms like paradigms, vision, theory, models and frameworks. So, these are basically um, uh, solid theories or concepts which help designers make informed decision and so that they can create meaningful experiences and effectively address the needs and wants of the users. So, paradigm refers to a general approach that has been adopted by a community of researchers and designers for carrying out their work in terms of shared assumptions, concepts, values and practices. So, now for example, uh, currently the paradigm in interaction design is referred to as user centered design. So, wherein all the designers, most of the designers are focusing on the uh, user that what are uh, the requirements and needs of the user. So, here in this paradigm the needs and goals of the user are the most important over anything uh, else. And also that the design solution should be evaluated based on their ability to meet user needs and improve their user experience. Other such uh, examples are uh, big data. So, there is a lot of uh, data nowadays coming from many different sources. So, how do we collate it? How do we analyze it? So, that is another example and also uh, internet of things. So, there are many different uh, such paradigms uh, depending on the uh, you know the time and place where we are. So, vision basically is we always associate the term vision with uh, future. So, this is uh, again provides a powerful driving force that can lead to a paradigm shift in terms of what research and development is carried out in companies and universities. So, a number of uh, companies you know conduct these uh, studies that what is the vision, what is their vision and what in 20, 30, 40, 50 years how do they see the future themselves in the future or the world in the future. For example, you know social equality is one such uh, vision that pe that you know people see we may achieve in the next few decades or um, uh, you know world peace may be achieved. So, these are some examples of vision. Another uh, example uh, from the technical side or design side is when Apple in 1987 created this vision wherein there was a scenario where a professor was using a touch screen tablet with a speech based intelligent assistant reminding him of what he needed to do that day while he was answering the phone and helping him prepare his lectures. So, you can see that how in uh, 1987 uh, this vision you know was of Apple which now is a reality or even we can take example of the mobile phone that how people at one time visualized or they thought that it would be 
you know uh, there would be a time when we will be able to talk to somebody as if we're talking face to face and now we have all these uh, features in the phone wherein we can talk with people who are even seven seas apart or um, you know different time zones and similarly there can be another vision that you know maybe through the tv screen in a while watching a cookery show probably we'll be able to also smell the food so that is uh, again another kind of a vision and that may or uh, uh, may not come true uh, depending on our technology advancement so another uh, current vision that is uh, very popular nowadays is artificial intelligence it is uh, there's a lot of debate going on in the area of artificial intelligence uh, while some say it is uh, very good uh, for the future and it makes our lives easier the other group uh, says the opposite that it will take away their jobs and uh, make life very difficult so a lot of people are interested uh, in this debate including journalists and uh, uh, social commentators policy makers and uh, even uh, common people like us so the uh, ai is now replacing the user interface for an increasing number of applications where earlier the user had to make choice so uh, while listening to uh, music i would probably you know choose my favorite songs but now ai uh, artificial intelligence knows that what are my preferences and uh, it will play those songs so it and now it is at a level where it can understand uh, my behavior even from my tone it can uh, guess whether i am in a good mood or in a bad mood uh, just like you know uh, other humans do that we see the gestures body language voice tone all of these things inform us about the person's uh, uh, you know mental state same uh, is uh, the level that ai is achieving and uh, uh, will soon you know will be almost human like in the past uh, few uh, decades there have been many theories in the area of human computer interactions which provide means to analyze and predict the performance of users carrying out tasks for specific uh, type of computer interfaces and systems so mainly uh, we have you know explored areas where uh, cognition is involved or uh, the social uh, networking of people is involved and in the area of uh, cognitive science lot of work has been uh, done and scientists designers have tried to determine that what is the best way for you know working on tasks or representing task uh, operations because we know that human brain has certain uh, limitations so it can store only so much information or can handle only uh, for example 10 phone numbers and nowadays with you know uh, mobiles uh, which everybody has we are not in the habit of uh, you know remembering phone numbers earlier we could remember many phone numbers when we were younger but now maybe just two or three phone numbers so how the brain is also you know anyway it has its limitations and so how can these tasks be organized so that the user is able to maneuver through them uh, in the best possible manner and uh, one of the main benefits of applying such theories in interaction design is to help identify factors like cognitive uh, social and others relevant to the design and evaluation of interactive products so using these theories we we can analyze and uh, see whether uh, the output is uh, effective or uh, we need to check some other theory now uh, models are visual representative uh, uh, of the idea so it de- depicts how the core features and processes underlying a phenomena are structured and related to one another so for example uh, don norman developed a number of models of user interaction based on theories of cognitive uh, processes which is a branch of cognitive science and they were intended to explain the way users interacted with interactive uh, technologies so these included uh, seven stages of 
action model that describes how users move from their plans to executing physical actions that they need to perform to achieve them to evaluate the outcome of their actions with respect to the goal. So, we can see uh, here in this diagram that how they perceive, they interpret, they evaluate to move towards the goal and how the intention action is helping them execute the task. So, the seven stages of uh, action that Don Norman has suggested. Now, in contrast uh, to a model, the uh, framework offers advice to designers as to uh, what to design and look for. So, framework is you know having the solution based where variety of steps uh, may be there uh, or concepts may be there, some uh, principles may be there and they have traditionally been based on theories of uh, human behavior, but they are now being developed from experiences of actual design practices and the findings are coming from the user uh, studies. So, uh, this uh, framework comprises mainly of uh, three elements. So, the first is the designer's model. So, which is that uh, as per the designer how the system uh, should ideally work. The next is the system uh, model, but how the uh, system actually works. So, how it actually works is portrayed to the user through the interface, through the manuals and other uh, you know help facilities like chat or other things. And third is the user's model that how the user understands how the system works. Now, this is an example of generating a framework for healthcare innovation. So, uh, innovation is something uh, you know which wherein we uh, come up with a fresh a new idea. It is uh, something which is not uh, existing uh, currently. So, now here it is broken into three uh, steps. So, the framework is divided such that it is a pre-design, core design and post design. So, in the pre-design stage the step one is contextual uh, inquiry wherein some field work uh, uh, will be conducted, some observations uh, will be made or interviews will be conducted to understand that what is the need. So, as you see that uh, the need uh, is always the first step and for that purpose for the first step context, uh, contextual inquiry we have to go on to the ground and understand. The second is the preparation and training now depending on what kind of innovation we are coming up with. So, the participant selection uh, whatever material we may require that material and any technology that we may be uh, trying to apply uh, applied science or any other uh, field. So, that we will be uh, prepare preparing and training. For example, if we are uh, using some AI models then we will have to uh, prepare those AI models or CNN neural networks or whatever the demand may be. So, we have to prepare some algorithms. So, that will come in this uh, step number 2. In the core design stage where the third step is now we will frame the issue that what was the problem, what are the experiences, the pain points and what needs to change. So, that will come and which will also be the uh, vision. So, like we discussed earlier that how do they see uh, you know the particular uh, group of people or participants benefit from this particular innovation and so that it can have a wider acceptability. It, it, although the sample size or sample study area may be small, but then it should have a maybe a global uh, reach. The next step here is generative uh, design, where the latent needs and challenges that are experienced and uh, uh, future state creation. So, uh, latent needs are the needs that people are not aware of until and unless a certain feature does not exist. So, they, 
they uh, so it is like an invisible need like we saw in the earlier lectures where uh, 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 Don Norman said that the solution should be invisible that is a good design. So, invisible is so latent needs are also invisible people generally do not even realize that they need them, but in their absence they feel some problem. So, what are those needs and other needs that need to be looked into and catered to? The next step is sharing ideas. So, here a presentation of the design work uh, is conducted, maybe uh, some uh, inquiry is conducted into the, uh, the ideas that are being shared. And in the post design, so the core design is where the as per this framework where a lot of people are working together coming up with ideas, visions and needs. And in the post design once the design uh, stage is over, then the data is analyzed, maybe they are going to compare the before with the after, the reporting of the findings will be made and finally, the requirements translation. So, what are the feasible priorities? what are the steps that have to be taken and what will be the final uh, shape of this technology and of course, the user uh, testing and feasibility all those things will be taken into account and this uh, step will then close uh, the loop and this loop may again uh, begin. So, this is uh, just an example of how this uh, uh, framework is used. So, uh, all these uh, terms that we uh, saw today which are uh, paradigms, visions, theories, models, frameworks. So, they uh, somewhere or the other they overlap. So, they are not uh, you know uh, in their individual silos, but uh, they may have some overlapping areas in which uh, in, in the way of conceptualizing the problem and the design space and also their uh, purpose. So, uh, with this we come to the end of uh, today's uh, lecture and uh, I will uh, see you in the next lecture with uh, where we will look at some uh, cognitive aspects of the users and how like we saw today the, the theories and we saw an example of the cognitive theory that how uh, people have you know limitations when it comes to cognition. So, we will explore uh, cognition a little bit further and we will see that how can we incorporate that in the uh, interaction design process, uh, keeping in mind the strengths and limitations of uh, the cognition. So, uh, thank you.